afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of Exec Club and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you all today to our VC Outlook. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank all of our season sponsors. They make programming at the club possible. We couldn't do any of this without them. Thank you so much. A few quick technical notes. You can submit questions to our panelists by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. For any troubleshooting, just email programs at executivesclub.org and members of the team are on, by to, on standby to assist you. In addition to today's program, I invite you all to join us for other upcoming events at the club. We have so many exciting programs coming up, including Chicago's Economy with Mayor Lightfoot and a panel of Chicago CEOs. And on the other side of the VC spectrum, we have NASDAQ CEO, Adina Friedman, and more. So visit executivesclub.org for more information and opportunities to engage. So thank you for joining us. We're thrilled to welcome our panelists, Sach Chitnis, Mar Hershenson, Antonio Gracias, and our moderator, University of Chicago professor and friend, Stephen Kaplan. Steve, thank you for your leadership and being our moderator again this year. The stage is yours. Great. Well, good afternoon and welcome. And thank you, Margaret, for the introduction. Uh, I love doing this event because I get to hang out with three awesome panelists. Uh, we have Such Chitness, who's the co-founder and partner at Jump Capital. We've got Mar Hershenson, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Pair Ventures. And Antonio Gracias, who's the founder, CEO, and CIO of Valor Equity Partners. And but before we get to them, I'm going to start by providing some kind of macro thoughts and stats about VC and tech, and then we'll go to the micro uh, and do the Q and A. So let me uh, share my screen and uh, just give you a little uh, context. So last year, uh, we were in the middle of a golden age of tech. You know, the new tech bubble, you had university endowments were just minting money. And uh, it turned out, unfortunately, to be the end of the golden age. And uh, you see, you know, this, uh, this year, the tech bubbles were, were, you know, tech booms were bursting. And uh, so the question is, you know, what's next? You know, where are we and what's next? So let me uh, show you where we are. So, uh, you know, the bad news is you look at tech returns uh, in public markets, uh, tech is down, you know, more than 30%. And this was uh, through the end of the month. It's down a little bit more since then. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, which we'll probably talk about, down 59%. So that's the the bad news. The good news is, you know, since January 2020, since the pandemic, you know, it's still up. So, and actually technology is still up quite a bit. People forget Bitcoin is actually up the most. So, you know, it's it's all, you know, depends on your, your lens as to, you know, whether it's uh, the best of times or the, the worst of times. Now, uh, the, you know, IPO market, you know, has closed. So you see last year was spectacular for exits. This year is, uh, you know, kind of back to uh, where we were many years ago. Uh, you see that again, you know, 20, you know, the Q2 was, was even lower. Um, performance, it turns out, is actually hung in there. So this is as of the end of Q2. So this already has a bit of the correction in it. It may correct more, but venture returns, this is uh, the returns to venture funds raised sort of since uh, the global financial crisis are still over 20% a year. You can look at that as, as multiple of invested capital. It's you know returning two or three times, actually four times for funds uh, in 2011. And relative to the stock market, which is this measure called public market equivalent, which tells you how a fund did relative to the S&P 500, funds of vintages post the global financial crisis are still running 60, 70, 80% ahead of the S&P 500 over their lives. And again, these could come down a little bit because they're not probably fully marked to market. But it's still been, despite the correction, it's been a great time 
to be a venture capitalist. And I, you know, I'm guessing we'll hear that from our panelists. Um, this annualizes what's happened, or no, sorry, this, this actually looks at how things have gone since the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. It really is the pandemic was very good uh, for panelists and is still, you know, again, even with the correction remains good. And uh, again, you can annualize this relative to the S&P 500 and it's still running 10% a year, 15% a year better than the S&P 500. So um, again, looking backward, pretty spectacular performance still. Um, that's do that. And what about investment? Investment has started to kick tick down. This is through Q2. Um, and there were preliminary Q3 numbers that said it's down, but it's not out. It's sort of still, you know, higher uh, than it was back in 2017, 2018. And uh, yes, yeah, is another way here looking at first financings down uh, relative to uh, you know, the last uh, year, but still kind of healthy relative to history. And the last two things uh, to look at, valuations. Valuations have not uh, come down, at least through Q2. And so we should uh, hear about that from our panelists. And um, there's some more valuations. And there's still a lot of capital. So the capital that has been raised by venture funds uh, through, this is uh, through the end of Q3, it's actually more than last year. So uh, there is uh, plenty of capital. So uh, I'll summarize what I said by the, the golden age is over. Uh, valuations are down, but not out. The, the performance you know, over the last 10 years has still been terrific. Uh, and there's still a lot of capital out there. So uh, now we're gonna talk about what will happen going forward, given all those facts. So what I wanna do is just start by asking each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and uh, tell us what their funds do. So uh, I'll go by uh, alphabetically by first name, Antonio. Steve, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really honored and grateful to be here. So I, I appreciate it very much. I appreciate all the work you're doing there. So in the industry, it's been very useful us over time and it, it really has been very helpful. So as a trustee of UFC, I'm very grateful for your work. Grateful to be here. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Um, yeah, so we are Value Group Partners. Uh, we have uh, several different strategies. Um, think about the overall mission of the firm is to invest in uh, really great companies with great entrepreneurs that are making the world better. It's where we are mission driven. It's very important to us and multi-sector. Uh, when you kind of layer down from that, we have an early stage venture fund that is you know, in partnership with a few corporates, basically focused on sustainability. That fund, we have about a billion dollars in our management over two funds in that strategy. Uh, and you know, we're, we're part, it's called Valor Saturn Ventures. So you can see it's in partnership with Starbucks, uh, Nestle and a few other large corporates. And the idea is when we're making, we're inviting series C or series A checks, we're helping them operationally um, with revenue generation from our corporate partners. And so, you know, a, an additional part of our strategy is that we want to be very, very value added partners, very helpful partners. And so we have an operating strategy in each one of our different vehicles. In our early stage venture uh, product, it's about helping companies generate revenue and that first customer they might need. In our late stage product, our growth fund, which is our flagship product, um, we are, we've just finished investing at 1.7 billion dollar fund there. We're out raising now a $2 billion fund. We're about halfway through that uh, as we speak. So we can talk about the fundraising environment for funds today. Um, in that product, we are kind of multi, multi-sector um, and really multi-stage. We run an early stage venture, non-lead product uh, to feed ideas into the main fund. And then in the main fund, we're investing really across technology platform shifts. So things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, we think about how the world's changing in technology platform shifts and then how it affects all the sectors of the economy. And we will shift sectors as we see opportunities. Um, so we'll, as an example, De, you know, de-escalate working on software um, and maybe work more on kind of hard tech when the valuations get out of line for software in the last couple of years. Our, oper our operating strategy there is all around um, really lean execution. We do some revenue generation using lean tools. We do process improvement using lean tools. And then we underpin all this with data science for our companies. And you know, you, when, when someone chooses us as an investor, 
they're getting our capital and they're getting our intellectual capital and our people alongside. Typically, we're deploying in for three, six months to a company and actually doing the work ourselves. So one of the things we pride ourselves on, we think the only people in America that, you know, we're not consultants. We actually go out, do work, roll up our sleeves. You've seen the case studies. Steve's had a couple of case studies on us. Um, you know, one, a couple on, te- one on Tesla and now soon to be uh, one on a company, uh, two on a company called Misfits that demonstrate the, the level at which we will operationally deploy to help our company succeed. Right. Is that, is that good? Does that cover, Steve? That's, that's a good, uh, somebody must be fundraising. Very good. Um, uh, Mar. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Uh, well, I want to say uh, this is a super fun event. Last year, I thought you were going to play videos of last year and compare to this year. Luckily, you didn't. So thank God. Um, and I met Sash last year. So that was great. Um, briefly about Pair, we are a pre-seed and seed fund. So we lead rounds in really, really early stage companies. They're at zero. So we typically back um companies that are not just pre-revenue, but pre-product. It sounds really, really scary. Um, And we help them find product market fit. So I think a lot of venture folks will run away from that phase. That's all we do. Uh, It means it comes with, you know, founder drama, pivots, et cetera, et cetera. But it also means that we're just focused on, you know, that one, exercising that one muscle. Um, We are a generalist, Uh, our seed fund, Unlike other seed funds that maybe you know a, a few GPs is pretty large, relatively large. We are we're twenty people, and we have specialists for different areas: biotech, um, fintech, healthcare, um, AI, etc. Um, and you know, we I can't talk about our next fund yet, but uh, significantly larger than our first fund, than our last fund, and happy to talk about that as well. Uh, about the fundraising environment, which I think, you know, impacts all of us here. Uh, but yeah, excited to talk, tell you what's going on in Seed. Excellent. Well, I did I did go back and look at the video. So I remember what uh, you and such said. <laughs> actually, actually the, oh. two you, the two of you were pretty nervous about valuation. So you, you know, you were, <laughs> you, were you, know, you, you look good, not, uh, not bad. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, such. We were, pro- we were probably smiling a lot more last year. <laughs> sure. uh, yeah, thanks again, Steve, for having us. Uh, I'm Sachi Chitnis with Jump Capital. I co-founded the fund about 10 years ago. We are a traditional Series A fund, uh, which means something very different this year than it did last year, I think. Uh, for us, that's typically investing in companies that are nearing a product market fit, typically closer to $1 million in revenue, uh, and we typically write 4 to $10 million checks. Uh, what makes us a little bit more different, we are Chicago-based, have a team dispersed on both coasts, but we are very thesis-led. So uh, much like Mars team, we are very uh, sector-specific. We have people that hone in on specific areas, we develop a core belief, and then go hunt and find that company. And many of those ideas come from spending time with smart investors at an earlier stage. Some come from trend lines at a macro level and happy to talk a little bit about some of the ones that we're seeing going into whatever economic uh, turmoil we're going into. Our fund, uh, last fund, our current fund is a $350 million fund. We closed in August of last year, which was um, reasonable timing, I'll say, generally speaking. Um, And uh, about half of that fund is focused on fintech, and the rest of the funds focused on areas like cybersecurity, infrastructure, future of work, B2B SaaS. Um, that's, That's us in a nutshell. Great. Well, thank you all again for being here. These are three actually very strong and terrific investors, and uh, it is uh, is great you're spending time with us. So now let me, uh, I'll I'll take you up on it, Such. So uh, 2020 and 21 were amazing years. 2022, we've seen a big correction. Um, How do you assess where we are now? And then I'm yeah, going to come to Mar and Antonio with the same question. Yeah, I mean, my general comment would be uh, a lot of uncertainty, right? It's hard to unwrap what factors are driving it. Um, and, you know, when we talk about new deals in our uh, team huddles and, and team meetings each week, the thing that I would kind of persist is we're back to kind of basics. We're back to the normal times, right? The heady days of running at deals with limited information 
are just non-existent anymore, right? The ability to do, I would call appropriate levels of uh, diligence and discovery. And a lot of it is around people um, because you are investing behind the founders and the teams. You're able to do more. Um, not only are we spending much more time on the road with founders, um, meeting them in person, which is seems like a novelty compared to the last two years, um, but we're also able to kind of get to understand the customer base a little bit better and, and so forth, because you're not running at the same velocity. Um, meeting a company to investing horizons have tripled in, in time frame, and so that's really made it a much uh, different environment or more normal environment, I'd say, from venture from the last two years. One thing I would say just overall is that we're really at uncertain times. We have not seen tremendous impact from a sales perspective. Um, we certainly feel like it's going to come. And the uncertainty is what's driving a lot of this, I would say, lockup in the system, personally. Um, when I talk to a lot of other VCs, they just don't have a good sense of where things are going. They don't feel good about it, but I would say... Um, it's the uncertainty that's really got people kind of in uh, in neutral right now. Interesting. Mar, you're very early. Does that affect you too? Um, to some extent. I mean, I think what uh, Saj was saying is absolutely true. I mean, in 2021, and you're, the graphs you just showed show it, Stephen, there's like this bubble in you know late 20 to late 21, <laughs> right? More deals, more prices, et cetera. I think um, you know, money was really cheap. So it was really easy for folks to raise money. It wasn't, um, if you were growing, even if you didn't have positive unit economics or line of sight to that, uh, you could still raise. Um, I think that's gone. So I think when such says go back to basic is basically to show that you can, you know, have more certainty around the company making money. Um, it's more sane. It's more sane for us doing diligence and it's more sane for me as an investor, I used to tell people in 2021, please don't go fundraising. It's still not working. You don't have product market fit. And they would turn around and they would have several term sheets at $100 million valuation. So I don't look like an idiot, I think, anymore to my, to my founders, which is nice. Um, you know, I think for us in Seed, we are really the farthest removed from what happens at the macro level. Um, you know, the macro is crazy. I mean, I mean, if there's the threats of a nuclear war, you know, the land war in Europe. I mean, it's just that everything sounds really bad, China. I mean, everything is like bad, bad, bad. So um, I can't really have that in my head when I'm looking for the founder that is going to build a great company and those founders are there. So it's almost, uh, you know, my partner says, just tune out the news so we can focus on finding these super founders. Um, and that's, you know, that's the advantage that we have at the seed stage. Now for the later stage companies in the portfolio, we need to bring some sense of reality. So interesting. So Antonio, now you're later. So you, uh, how, how do you see things? You know, I mean, I see the spectrum from early to late, that's right? right. Over right. The fund. Um, and I, I'm going to just, I, I just want to be, I, I'm going to be a little controversial because uh, I think it's probably fun for these kinds of panels. So it's not that I'm <laughs> trying to be controversial. Um, I, you know, we, we invest in companies kind of across our products that we, that have demand functions we call proentropic. That means as entropy goes up, they get better. And so these are great environments for us. And we're like kind of licking our chops here, raising fresh capital and getting ready to deploy. And if you look at our portfolios going back, they've done pretty well through, this, through the last couple of periods because it followed periods because they, we are selecting companies that are non simple and do better when things get bad. Um, when, when I, uh, when I look at the environment in terms of, in terms of risk and uncertainty, I actually feel very certain about the macro. I think it's getting bad, like 100%. Like, no, there's no, there's no, 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 Fed, share, yes. no, no, no Fed share wants to be Arthur Burns, okay? I mean, you know, slowing the rate cut too early and, and igniting inflation is not what you want to be as the Fed chair. Uh, you want to be Paul Volcker. So I'm, it's almost incontrovertible to me that, that, uh, that we're going to overshoot here on rates and that, that basic demand destruction has to occur to get inflation to come down because the employment markets are so strange, right? We're three and a half percent unemployment. So for me, the macro is going, the, the, demand, the fundamental demand functions in the, in the economy that we think about in terms of cyclical demand functions are going to get really tough um, or tough. Let me just say tough. I'm not sure really tough, tough, but the kind of stuff we're investing in across all the sectors where sustainability, it's kind of the defense tech we do, cyber, um, you know, it, it, if you look across all the things you're looking at in the economy, FinTech, blockchain, whatever, 
we're investing in companies that actually get better in these kinds of periods. Because what happens is we are we, we have uh, great products that are disruptive and they are usually going to be disruptions defined as better and cheaper. If you're better and cheaper and the consumer is really being thoughtful about what they're buying or companies are being thoughtful what they're buying, they're going to buy the best products and we think our companies benefit those periods. So I'm excited about it. I mean, I, I, I feel kind of badly saying that because I know there's a lot of pain in the world, but we're excited about it. And I, I think that Mar got it right. The, the one really, truly kind of black swan risk that we cannot control for is the geopolitical risk of what happens in Central Europe and in China. And, you know, let's hope that doesn't happen. There's something that there does not happen. There isn't a, nuclear, a tactical nuclear weapon that, that, that gets set off in Central Europe or the Chinese owned by Taiwan. But if they do, it will be a great opportunity to deploy capital into great companies that really need help. And that's how we think about it. So if you look at what happened in COVID, you know, we, we, we actually invested when, when the markets froze up at right early COVID, we were, we were, you know, very busily off investing. I was still flying around. I mean, it was kind of breaking the rules a little bit, but I was flying around. With these companies. And, you know, I'm a rule breaker by nature. Um, and we were flying around helping our companies. We had, you know, misfits, you know, we had an operating team deployed in the mm-hmm. middle of Philadelphia in COVID, wearing masks and like hazmat suits, helping these other facilities. We like this. This is when we should, when we really enjoy this kind of stuff, right? So this is when we, we, we get, I think we get best. So I'm excited about it. Very interesting. So, uh, and uh, you, you gave me a couple of sectors that you like, sustainability, cyber, kind of things that are non-cyclical or uh, defensive and cheaper and better. Um, Mar, what do you, what do you like? Uh, well, we are doing lately a lot of generative AI companies. Um, yeah. I think everybody, maybe it sounds too, you know, maybe dull news already. <laughs> I don't know. But it's uh, it's actually super exciting. Over the last decade since we started Pair, there's been a lot of analytical AI, so the capacity of machines to understand a bunch of data and suggest recommendations for various things. But what now AI is capable to do do is actually create things that only humans were able to create, like text or pictures or so on that truly we can't even tell, right? You need to be really good to know whether it was created by a machine or it was created, um, you know, by a human. In fact, I'm getting various emails now that says partly created with GPT-3. So I'm like really suspect of those emails. Uh, But what it means is Honestly, if you can rethink all software applications, assuming that computers can create, um, it's it's super exciting. I mean, I think you're going to redo a lot of the applications that we know today. Um, you know, as basic as uh, you know, CRMs or you know other tools that we use in our day to day. So I'm excited about that. Doing a lot of that. Also doing a lot of climate companies by accident. I work with uh, so as not as intentional as Antonio. Um, and we have a, a lot of the young founders care about the environment and they are drawn to actually working on this. So we're just uh, are seeing more and more of those companies, which is, uh, I think, really cool. Interesting. And such. Yeah, there are probably four uh, major themes for hunting within. Uh, one is, and I strongly believe in this, which is that regulatory and compliance is both uh, I won't say counter-cyclical, but certainly sustainable. And I think it's the, the looming presence of even more of it coming and impacting our uh, our uh, companies is going to be higher. So we're investing a lot behind that, both in the fintech and non-fintech space. I would say two is tax. Like we believe that it's frankly an underserved market of enterprise being able to navigate the tapestry globally of tax, especially when you have a distributed workforce in a more global consumer and customer environment. Uh, Three for us is, and again, this is part of that confounding uncertainty, is that you know it's gonna be negative, yet the unemployment is really low, right? Still something that everybody's grappling with. And our view is that that'll probably consist, uh, uh, continue, but also I think that there's this embedded um, capacity slack because of this hybrid environment. I don't know of any companies that are running at full bore productivity. And so we're investing a lot into workflow automation. How do you do more without having to hire as much, both because the people may or may not be there, but two, you probably have slack in the system that you can kind of stick with that same OPEX. And I think that a lot of companies will be buying around that. Those are the kind of the major themes that we're spending a lot of time in right now. And uh, what, uh, what would you all avoid? 
Um, I should also stick in there crypto because last year, um, they, I know you all have actually investments in blockchain and crypto. And I think last year, such an, and Mar, you were bullish. So that's, I'll, I'll say that, but, but you were cautious. You said it was early innings. So uh, I'll ask that what's happening with blockchain and crypto. And then uh, what else are you avoiding? Let's do blockchain and crypto first. Who wants to go I'm happy first? to start. Yeah, right. I'm happy to start. Yeah, I mean, we are still very bullish on it, right? I mean, I think you started with a page that had the the, the Greenspan phrase of irrational exuberance, right? That was very much the environment the last year. Um, so there's going to be a culling of the weeds of bad ideas, in my personal opinion. There's just a ton of infrastructure, whether you want to call it crypto 2.1 or the lot like, where people are much more thoughtful, becoming more efficient. And there's going to be consolidation. You're already seeing that occur. So I do think that all of that is happening. Um, now, when it comes to like the traditional kind of exchange base, I mean, it is, I, I have no ability to kind of forecast that, of course, nor should I, right? But at the end of the day, the whole markets have kind of taken risk off table and crypto is in the early innings still. So of course, it's a higher asymmetric type return asset class and it should stay in that category of a alternative asset class for the time being. So we're very bullish on it. We actually spun out our crypto group into a, a separate brand because it was just getting so much traction, so much activity, um, but really I would say more thoughtfulness on picks and shovels, on building the infrastructure for the long-term. Um, and you know, really certainly we think that there's gonna be a lot of consolidation or at least uh, rationalization of investment going forward. Mm -hmm. I, I would say Saj, you are the king of crypto. So I, <laughs> I, I, I leave it to you. Um, I think we're seeing the same thing. I mean, anecdotally, I think I still see the very smartest engineers going into crypto, even during the winter of crypto. So a lot of good people are still going there, um, the best people. So it's happening. And I think there's, um, you know, there's still some irrationality in the market is around evaluation of crypto seed companies. I don't know, post that. Uh, maybe Satch can comment on that, but that's true. Uh, and it follows the cycle of innovation, right? I mean, I think everybody was really excited about crypto and only a small percentage of the population was using it and was part of it. Um, you know, does it, we were all investing as if the whole entire world was going to be on crypto within 12 months. Of course, it hasn't happened, but it doesn't mean it won't happen, right? It's like the web and I think it will happen where you invest. It's super early. Anything you want to do in crypto, it's painful. Um, it's not like having an AWS and an application layer where you just sit down in a Starbucks and you pull it out. You really need to be the smartest person. So a lot of investments on infrastructure, a lot of things to be done. And then, you know, there's a whole, I'm sure Seth, you're seeing that a lot of companies, a lot of investment going into companies that are trying to make it easy for people to get onboarded into crypto. So how can you make it easier uh, for somebody, companies that are kind of in between web two and web three, hiding the crypto behind the scenes and having a UI that looks normal. So anyways, I, I think lots, despite winter crypto, uh, Steve, lots, I th I'm still seeing a lot of activity. Oh. The, the last investments we've done, they all have multiple term sheets and we have to still elbow people to get in a little bit. You know, so anyway, so that's that. Things to avoid. Um, okay, well, if you have some of these uh, businesses that are low margins or negative margins to begin with, uh, they're very, very hard to get financed by those growth folks, right? Uh, I think anecdotally, some of those growth people, if you go fundraise now, you're growing, whatever you're growing, five, 10 X a year, but you have negative project profit margins, they won't even take the meeting. So, um, you know, I, I think those are businesses that you have to have, you know, be willing as a seed investor to take the risk of actually having to go fundraise for those businesses later on, right? Doesn't mean they're not good opportunities. It just means that they're just harder to build today than they were two years ago. That's it. Antonio? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, we, we invest in platform shifts. And we ask ourselves in technology platform shifts. So we ask ourselves why these shifts are happening, what fundamentally drives them. And, you know, crypto for, for us, I, I'm going to step, I'm going to separate between block, what I call blockchain and crypto. 
So blockchain being the, the technology that drives all this stuff and crypto being the final applications, whether it's a coin or an FT or whatever, like that's how we think about it. And like Saj, we invest in infrastructure. Um, our, our original thesis, you know, going back, I, I think I, I think I bought my first Bitcoin, like, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago. And, and um, Mike Belichick was a CEO of, 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 Bit, of BitGo, one of our companies. He had it in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, a cold, like cold storage in his laundry room. I mean, that's how far back this goes, right? I mean, it's just amazing to think about. Talk about hard today. I couldn't even do it myself. I had to call, I had to call Mike and ask my buddy Mike and ask him to do it. Um, but for us, it's, it, this is fundamentally about really two, two ideas. One is a revolution in tracking assets. And that's what, the, that's what the infrastructure layer is about, right? Changing the way we track assets and do accounting for assets generally across, kind of across the board. And the second is about financial freedom. If you think about the world, right? There's, there's, like, there's just a few kinds of freedoms. There's like human freedom, freedom of speech, freedom to, to action, freedom to do what you want, and there's financial freedom. And if a, if a government takes one or two of those away from you, you've got a problem, right? They might be able to take away from your, your actual, um, you know, your, your constitutional type freedoms, but if they take away your money, or they control your money, you have a real problem. And there are lots of places in the world today where governments are using uh, uh, financials and financial system controls to control their populations. So we think that long-term blockchain is going to be, um, it will be adopted long-term, way past the, the depth of the web, actually, or maybe even similar in terms of information. And so we've been investing like Sachi in the infrastructure layer going way back. And we have companies, I mean, some of the companies we have in that, in that portfolio are, we had AirSax, which is Chicago, you know, really kind of Chicago based with Donald Wilson, Sachi, kind of your competitor. Um, we did it, we, uh, we have BitGo, which was, I think, the premier institutional wallet and now uh, in custody. We have uh, Lightning Labs, which is kind of layer, layer two for, for moving Bitcoin around, which is this idea of financial freedom. And some of the Republic, which is democratizing finance using some blockchain. These are the kinds of ideas we like, and they are really all around the infrastructure layer with these two things in mind. I mean, it, we, we want to revolutionize the way assets are, are tracked and how we probably move them. We want to actually in, uh, improve financial freedom globally in all the parts of the world that, uh, that people need it. Now, um... Interesting. So bullish about that, worried about a few things. How about the public markets? Are they um, oversold on tech? Should people go there? And, and that affects your exit. So how are you, you viewing the, the public markets and uh, how do they affect you? You want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I think it depends on, is it, so generally the public markets, um, you know, I've been doing this now for 25 years, right? So from my, my, my uh, intuition and my experience is that generally it takes like, you know, six, 12, maybe even 18 months to catch up. Public markets, um, they lead the private markets and they, they, they lead them with some velocity. That the problem that we have today is that, you know, when you look at the chart you had on the marks and, and the quarterly marks, we are, we are out fundraising. So we, we are looking at the competitive set and there's a very huge variety and how people are marking portfolios. And there's even huge variance how we're marking assets. I mean, we, we can go, we'll walk into a meeting with an asset that we share with four firms and there'll be four different marks. And what I assure you is they're all wrong. Okay, like none of this is correct. So it, it takes time for prices to correct in, in the fundraising market. So like Mar was saying, it's interesting earlier that you know, prices are coming down for people raising capital. But it also takes even more time for people to act to mark their, their portfolios properly. So this is there are these two dual problems that exist in the private markets, and I think that's actually happening in space. We have not seen, you know, we, the, the, the crossover hedge funds, which are new, you know, basically new to this part, to, to this business in this last cycle. They have had been uh, very violently because they have to really apply a public mark. Others have not, and so you know we're, we're seeing we're seeing that start to trickle back into the system. Um, you know, when I'm thinking about sectors, sectors in the, 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 the public markets are important to us and they obviously lead to exits long-term, but in the end, we are kept, in the growth funds in particular, we're driven by return on invested capital and growth. And so it, to Mars' point, if something has poor return on invested capital or, low, or negative return on invested capital, we win that anyway. And it's, um, you know, so it doesn't really matter to us. We're using a DCF analysis at a 25% plus mark, and we've raised that now in this part of the cycle. So it doesn't really matter to us. You know, we, we look at it and say five years from now, these markets will recover. I do think there are there are, there are some things uh, happening in public markets that are sort of interesting that may not be widely observed that might be novel for the people listening here. There, there's been a massive sell-off, of course, in technology, but not you know the, the baby's been thrown out of the bathwater both ways. Some companies that are I think experiencing real disruption, the disruption is being hidden by um, the correction, and some companies that are great are just being overcorrected and people aren't thinking about it carefully. I'll give you some examples. 
we we have a company um, that's in the advertising space called Atmosphere, which is which is disrupting uh, you know the platform advertising companies. And you know when you look at things like doing like Facebook, and I I don't, I'll get myself in trouble saying it's called anyway. You know people are like, oh, this is so cheap, it's so cheap, it's so cheap. Well, maybe it's cheap for a reason. Maybe it's not just the sell off. Maybe it's that their poor advertising business is being attacked by Apple and by other companies like Atmosphere, and they are going from being an oligopoly or a monopoly oligopoly into a more competitive marketplace where other people, other companies are finding ways to go around them and change and, and impact pricing for CPMs. I think that's entirely happening today and not widely observed. There are other companies like NVIDIA that I think are awesome and have gotten super oversold in the marketplace, right? So we look at chips as one of the, one of the sectors we have. NVIDIA is a great company. Um, it, it, does, it does have the problem of making stuff in, in, in Taiwan, but you know this will eventually get solved and they have great technology. And you know, to me, it's like mind boggling that they couldn't buy ARM in the US. And I don't know why we did that, but you know, mind boggling to me. Um, great company, oversold, will figure out its manufacturing problems with a great CEO. So I, I see it as like a little bit different than just it, it one um, monolithic idea that everything's oversold. Now, would you um, ever put I mean, money? You really do have, so you go really ahead. have the spectrum here, right? I mean, from, uh, you know, uh, Antonio has probably the full spectrum, but I would say, late stage crossover public all the way down to, you know, pre-idea or ad idea with Mar, right? I would say, and as you go through that spectrum, the transparency and price is more and more obfuscated, right? Um, what we saw in 2020, 2021 um, was this uh, movement of obfuscation or non-math equation valuations move further and further downstream, my personal opinion, again. Um, but what I would also say is that and then I'm going to use Jump's portfolio. We had so many companies that had raised money in the last 12 months. And so when you look at marks, generally speaking, we're waiting for something to give you that ability to make that change mark, whether it's an event, whether it's some reevaluation period of time. But many of them just are going to be operating for the next two, three years, just executing, um, probably to catch up to the valuations they attained during that heady period. So I don't think the marks, back to Antonio's comment, are going to come uh, at the same pace that you see it in the public markets. It's going to lag. Um, I actually think it's going to lag more than past, just because the amount of cash on some of these balance sheets are years, not you know months like it used to be. Huh. I, I would um, you know definitely add to that. Um, sitting on both sides, on the LP and the GP side, um, it's even hard to value. To, to understand what your asset allocation truly is, right? Because uh, the public markets have been uh, marked down and the venture markets, it's unclear how much they've been marked down. I think the more right. brand um, a fund has, so you can take a look at the top 10 venture funds. They're very aggressive on their markdowns. Um, the newer funds are less aggressive um, or the people that you know have not proven success. But I still think, what we have in venture, to your point, Zach, is a little bit overvalued. So we're, you know, the the um, you know the asset allocation is is a little bit out of whack, which is uh, you know tough if you're fundraising. Uh, anyways, that's that. To your question about the market, I think you know, uh, I think Antonio, you're 100. I was a chip designer, so I'm so excited that there are chips again. You know, that's so cool. Hey, chips uh, in America. Yes, <laughs> and now we have all these you know, billions of dollars that are coming to, you know, invest it in the U.S. to actually um, at least help us catch up with uh, TSMC, which I think is totally the right thing. Um, that's good for us, right? Um, anyways, uh, you know, I think if you look at, you know, for us, one of, this is very simplistic, and I'm not a public market investor, um, but, you know, you look at the SAS capital index, which gives you a sense of how people are viewing the best, you know, kind of business models in tech, you know, the super sticky 90% margin companies, et cetera. And it's come down. I mean, it was really high, right? Those valuations were much larger than NASDAQ and um, it's come down tremendously, you know, not, not 30%, but like three X right down. So um, is, is it still much higher than NASDAQ if you compare from a decade ago? So are we done? Um, I mean, I think there's gonna be a premium. They're generally better companies than a regular NASDAQ company. So, you know, um, I think it's pretty probably plateaued 
But if, like Zach's so saying, a lot of the private companies were valued at the 15x multiple, you know, whatever, 15, 200x multiples or 300x multiples. And, you know, that's going to be a bloodbath in 18 months. I don't know what's going to happen. TBD, TBD. Okay. So, the, and that means the valuations, later stage deals have come down. Have early stage valuations come down too? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I'll tell you the numbers, you know, um, right before the pandemic, like a, I would say like a super good seed was maybe 15 million. Um, I think at the, then it kept creeping up every quarter during the pandemic. The more Zoom minutes, the more the valuation would go up. Um, and at the end, I think it was closer to 30. You would get seats at 30, excluding crypto. Crypto is at another scale, okay? Uh, <laughs> but the non-crypto, you would see things at 30. It was no problem. Uh, that is gone. I think now we're back to 15 to 20. So still higher than before the pandemic, still higher, uh, but it's not as crazy and it's not going up every quarter. So I think it's like at least stable for the last mm -hmm. couple of quarters. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what I'm seeing. I don't know. And I know these numbers may sound completely crazy, but they're still high. Yeah, the Midwest is crazy, yes. And, you know, and maybe what I would say is the question I always ask a lot of other VCs when I meet with them is, what is market right now? And that's the uncertainty that people don't know, right? There was that FOMO on the, you know, back end of we'll call 2020, 2021, and now you just don't want to be the first one in, right? I, I, you, you sense that I don't know what a market is. If I price it inappropriately, I may be looking at the wrong, you know, entry point, um, you know, six months down the road. The reality is the earlier you are, the more um, latitude you have. So for people like us, you know, that are investing at that stage, all three of us are still out there writing checks. And uh, I would say the bar is higher, personally. I would say the bar is definitely higher. Um, but the, uh, the premise that you're still writing the checks, you have a lot more latitude if you're off by 20 to 15 on a valuation entry point versus 200 and 250, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the one thing I add to this, it may, may be an interesting, um, re, I may have already written this research paper, but I think it's an interesting research paper I never write, which is when you look at long-term returns on funds and um, kind of average entry multiples and wh what happens then later to return, I would like to see, I'd like to see a correlation on how much money GPs are putting in. Like the, the principal agent problem here, um, it, from our perspective, the principal agent problem here was like really bad at the peak of the cycle. If you're managing someone else's money, you're kind of running you're, and you don't do any work. It's easy. When you have a bunch of your own money at risk, boy, you're doing uh, some work. And, you know, when we are out in the world uh, talking to clients, one of the, the primary, you know, we have a lot of our own capital. Um, at, you know, the majority of my personal capital is inside of the firm. And I, I think there's something in this, which is, you know, if you're doing a software deal 300 times revenue, would you really do that with your own money? Um, and so I think, I, I really think of these peak moments that the principal agent problem becomes a real problem. And I'd be curious if you could ever figure this out, like a correlation to return to not just percentage of capital in the fund from GPs, but the actual amount of money they deployed, like, was it real money for them or not? Yeah, that's very good. Well, you give me the data and I'll, uh, I'll let you know. I know if we go. get the data, right? <laughs> You'd be great to get the data. Yeah. So, so let me shift. This is a Chicago audience where we're, we're uh, you know, three quarters of the way through. Um, what, uh, you yeah, know, Chicago has had a great run. We actually had a bunch of unicorns, uh, last year, I think, uh, 12, um, how is Chicago doing right now, uh, relative to the, the rest of the country and what are our strengths and, uh, and our weaknesses and, and such you're here. So I'll let you start it off and then, uh, we'll hear from, uh, uh, Mar and Antonio who are on the different coasts at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I, I would start with. Um, I think Chicago has been probably one of the, if not the beneficiary of COVID, if you had to put it in tech investing terms, right? Um, the premise that people were zooming in and able to do, to invest without having being a bicycle ride right away really benefited uh, Chicago to get on the radar. And certainly in areas like logistics and fintech and you know certainly um, the consumer uh, products, there's just a lot of activity here that was maybe uh, underwhelmed from a later stage capital. So I think that's where the unicorns came from, is just that, that ability to kind of ride that wave. If I look at it now and going forward, I think there's some really amazing strengths that there's a lot of industry-based kind of solutions. 
a lot of a lot more efficient models, relatively speaking, from a kind of thinking about CAC, payback, LTV, kind of customer acquisition models. Um, I do worry more for the D to C models, right? The ones that are going direct to consumer and having to acquire customers. That isn't the strength of Chicago, but it's certainly you start seeing more of those unfold here. You know, just a lot of people have questions on what the consumer wallet is going to do in the next 12 months because it hasn't really reared its head yet, even with inflation. Um, and then I think you kind of have this bifurcated, what I'm seeing in Chicago, a bifurcated kind of um, venture market. You have the late stage that raised a bunch of money that are really just executing, which is awesome. But you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs from exits in the past three years start new companies. So a really healthy pool of ideas at that seed stage, um, which is pretty exciting. I do feel like we have a gap probably in the middle, you know, for somebody that's like an A looking at B's at that stage, there's not as many of those. You see a little bit more of that kind of um, bookends or that uh, barbell, if you will. But, uh, but you're seeing you have to be cautiously optimistic right now. Yeah. So you're seeing the startups in Chicago. So they're still here and the entrepreneurs are here and they're they're <laughs> staying. I'm saying you're seeing good stuff. No, absolutely. I mean, if you go to, I mean, I've been to a couple of the Chicago venture summits, both the general one and the ones around food, around supply chain. They just had one recently. I mean, the attendance locally is off the charts, right? There's just a, a lot of people in the community that are both coming out of the woodwork because they've been working from home um, or remotely. And um, you're seeing a lot of experienced entrepreneurs, you know, go back at it again. And there's recent fundings that showcase this, but I think you're seeing those um, germinate right now. And that's part of that barbell that I think you'll, you'll see more of in, in Chicago. And hopefully like Antonio is right, like a lot of great ideas are formed during downturns. And the hope is certainly this is uh, an opportunity to build a business more so than ever. Cool. And what about Silicon Valley? What are you seeing there versus, uh, or what are you seeing here from there? Uh, well, you know, I have to say, um, San Francisco is still a little bit dead post pandemic. You know, it's not as, uh, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in New York in the last few months and it's, it seems back to normal. Maybe I didn't know the New York before the pandemic, but it's bustling with founders and, um, still not the case in San Francisco, um, mm. uh, at least, you know, next to our office. Uh, you know, I think in terms of, you know, one of the things that has happened, it is happening, it's inevitable. You know, the world is closer. It used to be when, you know, I started my first company in 2000, there was only one street where you could go raise money, Sand Hill Road. And, you know, that has been expanding over time. And I think that's, you know, not, going to change um, the, the trend that's happening. Um, during the pandemic, there were a couple of cities that were touted as the most important, you know, the next big thing, one Miami and, uh, you know, the other one LA. Uh, I would say both of them are really fun. So if you want to go and have fun, those are really fun cities to go. I didn't see kind of the obsessive founders uh, that you see here in the Valley. and you know, you see this, I see that in New York as well. There's a culture of work and obsession and ambition that I think is the most important to get companies working. At the end, it's all about, you know, the founder running the company, not where the people with the money live. Um, so because money, I mean, we're closer than before we can travel. So anyways, I, I'm, I'm, I am uh, betting on New York. You can put me down for next year. Interesting, interesting. And Antonio, you're in New York, Miami, and Chicago, so you're like all over. So what do you, what yeah. do you see? <laughs> I, I, I think, I think that um, my fellow panelists here are all right. Um, first, let me say, I lived in Chicago for 25 years. I love the city. I raised my family there. Kids went to lab school. I mean, I went to UC. Great. And I'm rooting for the city, 100%. Um, the, the, my, my answer to the Chicago question is that, you know, for decades, we have had a brain drain from the from Chicago, from the Illinois area, from you know University of Illinois is a great engineering school. You go look at the PayPal guys I knew in the old days. They all, you know lots of them went to University of Illinois, and I am hoping that uh, if you go to very first principles, what do engineers want? Um, they want to work on a cool company. They want to be able to eat well, have some fun, and date. Those are kind of like the basic principles I think that people are looking for if you're under the age of thirty, right? Uh, San Francisco used to be a cool place for that. It's not anymore. 
I mean, the, the valley closes at like 10 o'clock and if, unless you're married with kids, it's, I don't think it's all that cool place to live. Um, I think Mars right in New York is a cool place to live. People want to live here. I think that Sasha's right. Chicago is a cool place to live. You know, we have our largest offices in Chicago. We're moving into the West Loop because that's the cool place to go. And, you know, there's lots. Of it. So when you think about it, like where do really smart young people want to be and what they want? You know, they want to do great stuff. They want to have fun. And they and that I think Chicago is a great place for that. So I'm hoping that we're going to see less people leave uh, Illinois to go to San Francisco or New York because Chicago is getting cooler in the right places. Uh, you know, there are issues to deal with for sure. We need to deal with those issues, but Chicago is definitely uh, improving. And I mean, you know, I remember Rom had these stats or some crazy number, like 90% of the engineers are graduate from Illinois. That won't be quite right, but it was some crazy stat like this, leave to go to the coast. And I'm hoping that's going to stop because, you know, the coasts are still great. But I moved to Miami because the kids are out of the house and, uh, and you had better weather for my health. Um, and we put an office there because there is a lot of cool stuff going on there. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it really is not New York. And I think that what I would say on the coast is I usually think of San Francisco and LA as one market. I knew lots of founders that would actually float between the markets. Some companies that started in LA and they go to San Francisco and they kind of, there's like shuttles almost running back and forth, right? New York, Miami for us is one market. It, it feels like one market for us. And we cover it that way. Um, we have not extended to Boston, which we probably should, but New York and, L, uh, New York and Miami is it, it, really one market for us. And that's how I think the world's gonna shake out. It's that, you know, on the West Coast, you'll see San Francisco, LA come back as one market. Chicago, I hope, becomes a hub in the center of the country, and maybe it's paired up with Austin. We'll see. Uh, and then, you know, you have uh, Miami and New York as kind of one market. Wow. Okay. Do you think that I density like really that matters Antonio. here? Okay. Yeah, no. I mean, I think the density really matters here, and I 100% uh, right. agree with those comments. New York and Chicago are the front runners right now the next yeah. year or two years. So San Francisco, I, you think, is in danger. That's so interesting. So, yeah. Well, actually, you know, one thing that is happening, I'd love to hear what you have to say, Steve, but um, I, I heard, and maybe this is wrong, but at least it's directionally correct, that there were uh, 30 CS graduates at Yale in 2012 or 2013, and last year it was like the most popular major, um, and that's the same in all the Ivies, and they're all moving to New York, so... It's fundamental. It's not, you know, it's like you have this army of people that wants to go and build companies. I don't know if it's the same at U Chicago, um, but you know, it's really that the kind of the you know the fundamental parts of the of the economy of startups are changing where in these regions, right? Yeah, that, is, that makes a lot of sense. Now there there are a lot of people going to New York, and uh, that's you know from from here. I think it's it's all over. We get we get sort of a mix of Chicago, New York, and San Francisco from from our students. So so along that note, there was one question, and uh, you know we sort of uh, you know sort of uh, touched on it. What's going to happen with you know how people work and how you invest? Is it going to be remote? Is it going to be in person? And this is both for for how you invest and for how your companies operate. Are the companies the startups virtual? Or are they in a place like they're all in New York and people are there. How, what are you, what are you all seeing? And what do you expect to see? It's kind of a good yeah, I can, I'm, I'm happy to go first here. So uh, we brought our people back in, in um, I think May uh, in the year of COVID. So we've been back for a long time. We did allow them to go to any, if, if you were working in any office, at any of our office, we allowed you to move offices. So our San Francisco office basically emptied out. And, you know, those people almost all moved to New York. I have just uh, one person living in San Francisco. And the partner was there, covers it from New York. He moved to New York, is flying back and forth. Um, so in terms of our business, this is this is an apprentice business. You know, we teach people by being together, going to ski companies together. We, we're, and we're very thoughtful and we really want to mentor and be methodical about that at the firm because, you know, we're, we're at scale and we're, we're, and we're scaling more. So it's important for us to develop and build our young people. And we do that by, you know, there's process and systems, but it's really like, you're next to me and you're next to a partner and you're learning. So you have to be in person, that, that, that's our view. Um, at the company level, our guideline is we prefer the companies to be, it, depending on what they're doing, we prefer them to be in person. But there are some companies that run really well remotely and some that don't, depending on, on the, the style of the CEO, if you're working hard tech. So you know, if, you're build, if you're building defense systems with using the artificial intelligence, or if you're, you know, you're building hardware, you're building these kinds of things, you, I think you need to be in person. If you're building a consumer app, you know, probably doesn't matter so much. Like I think some of that was already outsourced anyway. Um, so I think it depends on the company, depends on the founder. Our guideline is it's better to be uh, in person, but we don't enforce it. It's not a rule. It's not enforced a discipline. It's really applied 
on a case by case basis. We have some great companies run full remote, and we have some great companies that run you know all in the office, depending on what they're doing. And so we we really try to assess that on a case by case basis. I'd say probably eighty plus percent of our companies are still are, are really uh, in person. I, yeah, I'm I mean, uh, I totally plus one that. for Antonio. Hmm? A plus one, you know, so I'm so summarizing plus one. I'm being, you agree. Very Gen Z. Okay. <laughs> Such? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say uh, bifurcated on our end. Um, our team has dispersed during COVID, LA, New York, uh, St. Louis even. Um, but uh, our T&E is you know, I would say off the charts, not just an inflation perspective, but just people are traveling more. And even our companies, if you flip it to the company side, even the remote companies are not doing it for cost basis. It's just to find the talent. And they're spending much of that money, if not all of it, on getting the teams together on a regular basis, the successful ones, I would say. And so for, I think that we're going to see the gravitational pull back to centers of gravity of people hiring nearby because Besides dev, which has always been a very independent execution focused and talking software dev, um, you know, much other functions require that mentorship, that collaboration, that teamwork that you have not seen that same efficiency in any of those models and any of those functions um, in a remote or hybrid environment. So I do think that you can see hybrid, but you can see it centers of gravity starting to form uh, in specific cities if they're not already. I feel super strongly for early, early stage. Like if you're building something from nothing, it's really hard to have three people very far away on a Zoom creating. Like Zoom is, or remote is very, it's great for efficiency and execution. It's terrible for creation, right? And imagination and being on a whiteboard. So I am very, 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 for me, it's like, I cannot do a pre-seed when the team is remote. I can't do it. Oh. It's really hard. You know, I, might, I might add one thing to this was it's just not very fun. Like it really is not, fun, you know, like, I mean, just think about how much it sucked to be in your house by yourself trying to collaborate with people on Zoom. When you get in a room with your team and, you know, you're like, you're riffing on stuff, you're making jokes, you're having some, you know, having a pizza. It's oh, really? fun. Like it should be fun, right? It's not fun. Oh, it's a grind. And I mean, the mix is probably okay, but man, we want our founders and our people to have fun. This should be not fun. Really. Uh, so on that note, we're at the end of our hour, and uh, I hope we had fun, even though we were on Zoom. Uh, I had fun. I, 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 Great I to meet a, you guys. I took a few things out of this. First of all, lots of uncertainty and, and maybe veering on like things are going to be negative. On the other hand, uh, it's kind of a new normal. Like it was crazy. It was like things got out of hand last year, and now it's going to be normal. And there are real opportunities that all of you were excited about and that are you know, more or less exciting for the world. So we should expect good things to happen as we work out of the, the crazy macro, which, which, which will be, uh, take some time to do. So uh, an optimistic note, I think, and uh, let me thank you all. It was great to see you. You were awesome. And uh, I hope we can uh, do this again. And uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thanks, Bye -bye. Steve. Thank you so much.